Mmm, tradition, you make the best apple cranberry cocktail. Oh, oh, hey, didn't see you there. Well, it appears as though my video breaking down Vern Unsworth's lawsuit against Elon Musk has been demonetized. Confirmed on appeal, limited or no ads will be running on that video as originally published on YouTube, which is why I have taken the time to re-edit the version into something of a YouTube-friendly, monetizable video. It seems as though I have used one, if not more, of the terms not to be used even when reading written pleadings on YouTube. It seems I should be following the lead of other YouTubers and actually using code words to not use the bad words so that we actually live in a grade school environment on the biggest video hosting platform on earth. I won't do it. I will not do it. I am stubborn, I am stupid, and I am stubborn. And I've said this before and I'll say it again because I mean it every single time I say it. It is not about the money when a video gets demonetized. Once a video gets demonetized, YouTube basically puts that video into the proverbial pits of despair on YouTube. Where am I? The pits of despair. The video is disappeared for any and all exposure on the platform and I worked too darn hard reading that lawsuit, doing the research, making the video, editing the video, posting it online, putting the links, putting the text to let YouTube demonetize that video and effectively kill it because I said one or two words that YouTube doesn't like. And when I say that I said those words, I don't mean that I used the words. I mean I literally read those words from pleadings, from articles, from lawyer statements in the file. And another thing, in doing the research for that video, I watched a ton of other mainstream media reporting on that and it didn't look like their videos using the exact same terminology got demonetized. But it is the game of attrition through frustration. You can only have accredited, authoritative news sources talking about certain things. You can't have these rogue, independent Canadian lawyers actually just reading through legal proceedings, explaining them in ways to allow people to understand them. And yes, I put on a jacket to look particularly snazzy for this intro. So that is it. I have gone through the video to edit it to make it YouTube friendly so that it remains monetized and viewable to the world. And instead of reading aloud the terms that cannot be read aloud lest the video get demonetized, I have just replaced those words with the most annoying noise on earth. Please enjoy the viewing. If you would like to support the channel, please consider purchasing some merch. And now I present to you the video. Vernon went toe to toe with a billionaire bully. Not many people have the courage to do that. Vern Unsworth did not go toe to toe with a billionaire bully. He started a fight with a billionaire bully and then sued him when he got called names on Twitter. <laughs> Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber. I do vlogs, and the judgment in the Vern Unsworth versus Elon Musk defamation suit is in. I take for granted everybody watching this vlog knows what I'm talking about, but in case you don't, Vern Unsworth sued Elon Musk for $160 million in damages because Elon Musk referred to Vern Unsworth as the <laughs> in a now infamous tweet from 2018 in the context of the Thai cave rescue. You know what? In case you don't actually know what I'm talking about, let's start from the beginning. Late June 2018, a 25-year-old assistant soccer coach takes his team of children aged 11 to 16 exploring a cave in Thailand. Apparently the cave does flood during the monsoon season, but the coach has taken the kids to visit this cave well in advance of the monsoon season itself. They enter the mouth of the cave and unbeknownst to them, somewhere in the distance the monsoon rains have come early. And stuff out of nightmares, the entrance through through which they came begins to fill with water and in order to find drier land, the children go further into the cave in order to find a higher space to stay safe and dry. They end up two and a half miles into this cave system and basically disappear without a trace to the rest of the world. Something like nine days later, the group is finally located alive and well in the cave system by a group of divers. But being discovered alive in the cave after nine days in as much of a miracle as it is, is not even a beginning of the solution. The divers now need to somehow find a way to get all 13 of these kids through the two and a half mile flooded cave system to safety. Divers are able to bring in oxygen, food, water, but they still need to get these 13 kids out of the cave before the monsoon season comes in and fills the cave entirely. It's a race against time in the most literal sense. Incidentally, I did a video at the time to the effect that no one should be blaming the coach, the 25 year old kid who brought these kids into the cave system in the first place. As is the case when these types of stories break, people just look for someone to blame and people were jumping on the bandwagon, blaming the coach, saying it was irresponsible of him to take the kids into the cave system. In reality, whatever mistake it was that led to consequences that were exponentially beyond what anybody could have possibly foreseen, that coach kept those kids alive and that coach was the last one out of the cave. That coach to have kept the kids alive, well, and mentally there for nine days trapped underground in a cave system is an absolute hero of monumental proportions. 
And if you want to watch that video of me sharing my thoughts, I'll link it right here. So that is the overall context. Now, who is Vern Unsworth? He's quite familiar with Thailand, and we'll get into this in a bit, but he actually knows of the very cave system in particular where these kids got stuck. And so when the world rallied around this rescue effort to get the kids out of the cave, Vern Unsworth, who knew this particular cave system very well, was one of the people volunteering to help save the kids. And while the world was rallying around the rescue efforts of these kids, other players got involved, including Elon Musk. Now the details of the rescue are absolutely amazing. They're beyond comprehension, but they might be a video of its own. Suffice to go over some of the essential details, a lot of the kids on this soccer team, let alone not being familiar with diving, didn't even know how to swim. And so even once they were discovered, it's not obvious how you get these kids through a two and a half mile cave system, which involves going underwater through the cave. Massive pumps were brought in to pump out billions of gallons of water to at least lower the water level in as much as possible within the cave system. But apparently the idea of completely draining the cave system itself was totally unrealistic. All the more so given the fact that monsoon rains were still coming and were just replenishing the water that was being pumped out of the cave system with those pumps. And incidentally, the rescue efforts themselves actually involved sedating the kids while they were taken underwater through certain portions of the cave system. Sedating them so that they wouldn't panic and cause problems while they were being transported out. Absolutely out of this world madness of a rescue operation. But given the realities and the complexities of the situation and the potential rescue, Elon Musk comes into the picture sometime around July 9th, offers the technical assistance of his Tesla or SpaceX team, and comes comes up with the idea of potentially having something of a small submarine, something like a pill, to put the children in while they're being rescued and transported through the cave system. Elon Musk's submarine of an invention is called the Tube, and it's actually delivered to the Thai cave on or about July 9th, 2018. Admittedly, by that time, eight of the 12 kids have already been rescued from the cave, leaving four kids and the coach. But Elon Musk did in fact deliver his Tube submarine of a proposal of how to get the kids through the cave system and out to the entrance. And this is where Vern Unsworth decides to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Elon Musk. July July 13th, 2018, Unsworth agrees to do an interview on CNN and he is asked about Elon Musk's proposal of a tube of a submarine of a solution. And for whatever the reason, I can easily imagine that Unsworth was sort of overwhelmed by the moment, overwhelmed with the celebrity status of the situation. Unsworth, for whatever the reason, refers to Elon Musk's tube of an idea as a PR stunt. He says it has absolutely no chance of working, that Elon has no idea what the cave system is about, and that Elon should stick the submarine where it hurts. and stick his submarine where it hurts. I don't even know if this is one of the things that I have to bleep out of the video to make it monetizable. And that is where the fight started. July 15th, 2018, in response to Vern Unsworth July 13th comments on CNN, Elon Musk posts a tweet on his Twitter account referring to this British expat as the and that tweet is ultimately what served as the basis for the defamation lawsuit filed by Vern Unsworth against Elon Musk. Now we've gone over a lot of the factual basis that is outlined in the lawsuit, but let's go through the lawsuit itself very quickly. L. Linwood PC, L. Linwood will seek admission pro hack vice, Robert Christopher Catham, United States District Court, Central District of California, Vernon Unsworth plaintiff versus Elon Musk defendant, complaint for defamation. So just a few initial observations which are kind of interesting. L. Linwood is a name that should ring some bells if you've been watching my channel for a little while. L. Linwood is representing Nicholas Sandman in his $250 million lawsuit against the Washington Post, CNN, and others. L. Linwood is a prominent defamation attorney in the United States. The term pro hack vice is another term that we saw in a previous vlog. And what it means is that the attorney who wants to act in this particular case is not necessarily certified to practice in that state or jurisdiction, and they are therefore asking for specific permission from the court to act in this particular case, despite the fact that they don't have certification within that specific jurisdiction. Paragraph one, this court has diversity jurisdiction pursuant to 20 28 USC over this defamation action, which arises out of unlawful, unstoppable, and reprehensible accusations by California citizen, defendant Elon Musk. It has since been brought to my attention that I said unstoppable and not unsupportable. That is why I always show the text when I read, because I sometimes misread things. Sometimes. Unsupportable. Who falsely conveyed that United Kingdom citizen, plaintiff Vernon Unsworth, Mr. Unsworth, is a- <laughs> Paragraph 2, from June 24th, 2018 to July 10th, 2018, Mr. Unsworth was one of the many individuals directly involved in the heroic and ultimately successful efforts to extract 12 boys and their soccer coach from Tam Luang Nang Non Cave System located in Northern Thailand, the cave system. Interesting observation, by the way, Vernon Unsworth is defined as Mr. Unsworth, whereas Elon Musk is defined as Musk and not Mr. Musk.
It is not an accident, by the way, it is a legal jab of disrespect. All right, and then at paragraphs 7 to 14, we describe the parties who Vernon Unsworth is. Paragraphs 15 to 22, we describe who Elon Musk is. And then at paragraphs 23 to 69, we go over the entire timeline and description of the actual ordeal of the cave rescue itself. It is mind-blowingly interesting to read. It is spiritually uplifting to see how people can come together. It will make for a harrowing book and an enthralling film someday soon. But let's move on to paragraph 70, which describes when the fight between Unsworth and Musk begins. On July 13th, 2018, Mr. Unsworth agreed to participate in an interview requested by CNN to discuss the cave rescue. Questioned by the reporter as to what Mr. Unsworth thought of the tube, Mr. Unsworth stated, among other things, that Musk's tube was a, quote, PR stunt, that the tube, quote, had absolutely no chance of working, and that Musk, quote, had no conception of what the cave passage was like, adding that, quote, Musk can stick his submarine where it hurts. I mean, what is the purpose of these types of comments? Mr. Unsworth is presumably there with sincere and noble intentions. Why does he have to impugn the intentions of Elon Musk? This is not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a big bully billionaire bad boy. This is impugning the intentions of somebody else for no better reason. It is starting a fight where no fight needed to be started in the first place. I would not impugn Elon Musk's intentions and I would not assume that it's a PR stunt as though Elon Musk needs this as a PR stunt. And regardless of what a hero Vern Unsworth is, in fact, in reality, there was absolutely no need to start the fight that he just started. Paragraph 72. A Apparently angered by Mr. Unsworth's criticism of his tube in the CNN interview, Musk embarked on a PR campaign to destroy Mr. Unsworth's reputation by publishing false and heinous accusations of criminality against him to the public. After the CNN interview on July 15, 2018, Musk published from his Twitter account the following tweet about Mr. Unsworth. Never saw this British expat guy who lives in Thailand, sus at any point when we were in the caves. Only people in sight were the Thai Navy arms guys who were great. Thai Navy SEALs escorted us in, total opposite of wanting us to leave. Paragraph 74, sus is commonly understood as an abbreviated form of suspicious. On July 15th, 2018, Musk subsequently published a second tweet from his Twitter account about Mr. Unsworth. Water level was actually very low and still not flowing. You could literally have swum to K5 with no gear, which is of how the kids got in. If not true, then I challenge this dude to show final rescue video. Huge credit to Pump and Generator Team, unsung heroes here. Paragraph 76, on July 15th, 2018, Musk subsequently published a third tweet from his Twitter account about Mr. Unsworth. You know what, don't bother showing the video, we will make one of the mini sub pod going all the way to K5, no problemo. Sorry, <coughs> you really did ask for it. Paragraph 77 <coughs> is a well recognized shorthand phrase for the term. <coughs> And later on, the motion goes on to allege the following. Paragraph 80. On July 18th, 2018, following public comments by shareholders of one of his companies expressing displeasure with Musk's accusations of <laughs> against Mr. Unsworth without any evidence, Musk deleted the July 15th accusatory tweets and published two tweets which purported to be an apology. As this well-written article suggests, my words were spoken in anger after Mr. Unsworth said several untruths and suggested I engage in a sexual act with the mini-sub, which had been built as an act of kindness and according to specifications from the dive team leader. None Nonetheless, his actions against me do not justify my actions against him, and for that I apologize to Mr. Unsworth and to the companies I represent as a leader. The fault is mine and mine alone. Paragraph 81, although Musk's, quote, apology to Mr. Unsworth stated that his accusations were not justifying and were made out of anger, the, quote, apology significantly did not disavow or retract his accusations of <laughs> against Mr. Unsworth. Now this is an interesting allegation in fact because it alleges that Musk did not really offer much of an apology and that he did not disavow or retract his accusations that he made in his July 15th tweet. Despite making this allegation, it nonetheless alleges that Musk did in fact make the apology and delete his July 15th tweet. So it's going to be up to you and ultimately up to the jury as to how they interpret this set of facts, but these are sort of inconsistent allegations in the motion itself. Musk deleted the offensive tweet at issue and issued a public statement of an apology, but it wasn't really an apology because it didn't disavow or retract the initial tweet, although it is specifically alleged that Musk deleted the tweet. To some, this might look like someone who wants to continue the fight even after the delete has been tweeted and the apology been issued. Paragraph 82. On August 6, 2018, Mr. Unsworth, through counsel, transmitted a letter to Musk at the email address identified by Musk, which letter advised him that his accusations of <laughs> against Mr. Unsworth was false and requested that Musk correct the public record. Paragraph 83, August 28th, 2018, Musk responded by publishing a seventh tweet about Mr. Unsworth. You don't think it's strange he hasn't sued me? He was offered free legal services and you call yourself Yoda. All right, and now we are descending into the human element of conflict. Musk deleted the tweet, issued a public apology, said that he spoke out of anger and that normally would end the situation. Enter the lawyers who start issuing lawyers letters saying, nah, that wasn't enough, now you have to do even more. And then we have clashing egos and what does Elon Musk do? He goes right back into fight mode. 
August 28th, BuzzFeed runs an article about Elon Musk's tweets and accusations against Unsworth. And then on August 30th, Musk writes an email to the journalist who wrote the August 28th BuzzFeed piece in which he writes as follows. I'm not going to read it out loud, but I don't want this video getting in trouble. I'm just going to put up a screenshot and you could read through Elon Musk's email itself. Paragraph 92, it's alleged that Elon Musk sent a second article to that BuzzFeed journalist, which reads as follows, screenshot for the same reasons. to go over the basics of the law of defamation. I've done a ton of videos on the subject. I'll link the playlist right here. In a nutshell, for there to be defamation, statements have to be made, they have to be published, they have to be false, and they have to damage the reputation of the person against whom they are made. If the person about whom the statements are made happens to be a celebrity, there is an additional criteria of actual malice. Meaning it has to be proven not only that the statements that were made were actually false, but that they were made with actual malice as relates to the subject of those statements. And when it comes to being recognized as a public figure for the purposes of a defamation law, Suit, you have your obvious by definition public figures such as politicians, you have your celebrities, artists, musicians, etc., people who live in the public light, versus your private citizens who don't live in the public light, which is why when it comes to proving defamation against a private citizen, it is somewhat of an easier task. And then you have these things called limited purpose public figures, which would be private figures ordinarily, but they are made public figures as a result of a specific event. In this particular situation, there really is no question in fact and in law that Vern Unsworth was a limited purpose public figure. He was out there making public appearances on a specific subject and as such would definitely be treated as a public figure, albeit a limited purpose public figure. But on what basis was his defamation lawsuit against Elon Musk tossed? From what his lawyer said on British television, it appears that the jury did not feel that the tweets at issue were of and about Vern Unsworth. The jury misunderstood the law. They got asked five questions. The first question was, is it defamatory? Tick, yes. Secondly, had it been published to other people? Answer, tick, yes, it had been. And the third question was, did the tweet refer to Vernon Unsworth? No, end of case. While the tweet did in fact refer to the... <laughs> The jury apparently came to the conclusion that the tweets were not obviously about Vern Unsworth and as such were not defamatory against Vern Unsworth. And from what I've seen in other reports, apparently the jury wasn't even convinced that the tweets were themselves defamatory. It seems that the jury found Elon Musk's defense compelling in that this was just a Twitter war. Nobody was intended to take these tweets seriously or as factual statements. And ultimately, as offensive, inappropriate, childish as I find these tweets to be, I don't think anybody would actually be inclined to believe these tweets as statements of fact. This is clearly just a stupid Twitter war between between two people with big egos who wanted to fight about something. Admittedly, I'm not the individual that's the object of the tweets, but I would not be inclined to take Elon Musk's tweets any more seriously than Vern Unsworth's statements on CNN. But when you impugn someone's good intentions for no better reasons, call them all sorts of names and tell them to go stick a submarine where it hurts, which I presume means in his <laughs> You have to expect a reaction. It doesn't make the reaction any less childish than it was, but you have to expect a reaction. Accusing someone with good intentions of partaking in a PR stunt, saying they have no idea what they're doing, that they should stick their submarine where it hurts, is not going toe-to-toe -to -toe with a billionaire bully. It's starting a fight with a billionaire bully for no good reason. And Twitter being good for what is good for, that is where people go to have these stupid, juvenile, infantile Twitter wars. Musk's tweets were stupid. They pretty much shocked the entire world to the point where shareholders were asking Musk to apologize, which he did. But I don't think a great many people were taking those tweets to be actual statements of fact. Even more importantly, and from what I understand this was argued by Musk's attorneys, it didn't seem to have any impact whatsoever on Vern Unsworth's reputation. No damages, no judgment. In any event, if this entire lawsuit is good for something, it is good to show how even grown adults can find stupid reasons to fight their way all the way to court. And that is the story of Vern Unsworth versus Elon Musk. If you like my videos and you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, drop a comment in the comment section below, share my channel with someone who you think would appreciate it. If you want to support the channel. All the support links are in the pinned comment and I greatly appreciate any support. Merch, merch is great also. And just to end this on a positive note, it's not because it's on the internet that we're not actually speaking words to other people. You don't cross oceans by burning bridges and you don't build yourself up by tearing other people down. In as much as possible, give everybody the benefit of the doubt, assume good intentions until incontrovertible evidence to the contrary, and now you know your vlog. Peace out. Booyah. I don't even know.
know if this is one of the things that I have to bleep out of the video to make it monetizable.